Paul, with Silas and Timothy, had been working his way westwards across Turkey. Eventually they reach Troas, on the coast of the Roman province of Asia. And there something happens of great significance. This was a hugely significant moment in Paul's missionary journeys. We read in Acts 16 that originally Paul had intended to continue through what we now call Turkey in a westward direction. But the Holy Spirit, he says, prevented us from this plan. We don't know what Paul's alternative plan would have been, but he was forced to turn north. And he had a vision of a man of Macedonia calling him to share the gospel there. So he heads north, reaches the port of Troas, and from there sets sail across the Aegean, past the island of Samothrace, and lands here at Kavala at Neapolis. From here, he heads inland to the very significant city of Philippi, then along the Ignatian Way to Thessalonica, on to Athens, and then turns south to Corinth. For us, this is enormously important. The distinction won't be made in quite the same way, but for modern readers, we realize this is the first time Paul sets foot in Europe, and his missionary journey takes him in a new direction. We're here in Kavala, which was the ancient port of Neapolis. The name Neapolis simply means new city. This became a very significant place because in Paul's day, the Ignatian Way, which ran uh, across to my left here, was actually in poor repair. So this would have been the natural place to come to Philippi. It's a little about 10 miles inland. Most people would have come to Philippi through this port. And Paul would have sailed in here and landed uh, here at Kavala. I'm standing here in the Greek theatre at Philippi and behind me you can see the valley of Philippi, enormous flat expanse between here and the mountains. Philippi was uh, established as an administrative centre by Philip of Macedon, named after himself, but it became really important as a Roman colony. In the valley behind was a key battle in the establishment of the empire in 42 between Octavius, who became uh, the first emperor Augustus and Mark Antony, Antony and their enemies Brutus and Cassius. And after the battle, this became a colony and it was settled by Roman veterans. But in New Testament times, it was more significant for being a Roman colony, uh, occupied by people with Roman citizenship. And as a Roman colony, it was expected to be, if you like, a little outpost of Rome. So people lived according to Roman values and ways of life. It exemplified how you should be a Roman citizen. Paul sees that very much as a pattern for the church. Christians are not to see themselves as citizens of whatever country they happen to live in, but as citizens of heaven, of New Jerusalem, their mother city. So we don't adopt the lifestyle and the values of those around us, we live according to our home city as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Here we are by the river, just outside the city gates of Philippi. Paul is in unknown territory. He hadn't planned to come here, but the Spirit of God had made him cross the water and come into what we now call Europe. He's coming to Philippi, and his normal strategy would have been to go to the synagogue, but there's no synagogue in the colony. So he's come outside the city to what the Jews would have called a place of prayer. And he finds Lydia and some other women. They can't form a synagogue, there are no men here. Paul explains the good news of Jesus, and Lydia and her household believe. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Jesus' promise to the woman at the well in Samaria was that he would give her a gift of living water, or we might say water of life. We would call this river running water, but in the Greek the New Testament was written in, it would be described as living water. So it was the habit of the early Christians to be baptized in living in running water to symbolize the promise of new life that Jesus gave. So it was natural for Lydia and her household to be baptized here in the river. Just below me, below the rapids, there's actually quite a still pool. And on the other side, the tradition has been continued. Christians have built a cross-shaped baptistry so they can walk into this living water, this running water 
to receive the promise of new life that Jesus gives and walk out the other side living a new life for Jesus. So here I am ready to be baptised and I'm coming in from one side of the river which represents my old life, the old way of doing things and I'm ready to immerse myself in the living water. It's a little bit cold. It's actually quite nice when you get used to it. And if I was doing this for real, then this is the point in which I'd be immersed. I'm not quite dressed for that today. I think I'd have to be careful not to get carried away with it. And then I come out the other side representing the new life I'm now going to live. The significance of this place in the coming of the Gospel to Philippi is marked by a small church building. Outside on the front there are mosaics of the key figures in the story. Here we find Paul and his partner Silas and of course the woman who first responded to the story of the Gospel, Lydia. There are paintings of Paul and Silas inside the church building as well. And on the floor is a large mosaic showing a map of Paul and his companions' journeys through Turkey, across to Greece, and then south to Athens and Corinth. But now let's go back into the city itself. I'm standing here in the bathhouse area of Philippi, and this particular bit of building dates back to the Roman period. So this is a place that Paul, Silas, and the first followers of Jesus in Philippi would have been very familiar with. Bathhouses were significant places for first Christians because before they had their own buildings, these are the kind of public places they could have met together, encouraged one another, and listened to the apostles' teaching being passed on. In Philippi, the inscriptions are particularly interesting. The main inscriptions are, of course, in Latin, showing that this was a Roman colony and really identifying who is in charge. But a lot of more popular inscriptions, particularly uh, parts of devotion to the deities, were written in Greek. And that shows that, like many Roman colonies, the day-to-day -day language, the street language, was in fact Greek. One other thing that's very interesting about inscriptions is the role of women. In the places devoted to Dionysius and to Liber Pater, the Roman equivalent, many of the inscriptions come from women. And in fact, we know from them that some very wealthy women lived here and they gave very significant donations to the cult. But the real heart of Philippi, as of any other city in the Greek and Roman world, was the marketplace, what the Greeks called the Agora and the Romans called the Forum. It looks fairly peaceful now, but it was surrounded by public buildings, the council house, the library, commercial buildings, shops and so on. This is where people met to do business, to talk politics and to meet friends. This is where the shops were, and where craftsmen such as Paul the leather worker and tent maker could set out their stalls. It's where the poor would hang around, hope for charity or perhaps look for work. And it's here that opposition came to a head. Some owners of a slave girl had profited from her power to predict the future and they were furious when Paul had delivered her from this gift. So they dragged Paul and Silas to the marketplace and they took them before the authorities and accused them of anti-Roman activities. I'm standing here next to the place which is reputed to be the place where Paul and Silas were imprisoned uh, according to Acts 16. We can be sure that it was a cistern of some sort but beyond that we can't be definite about anything else. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Of course, the story doesn't end there. The earthquake shatters the gates, and the jailer is terrified that the prisoners would have escaped and that he would be held liable. So he turns to Paul for help, and eventually he and his family all become believers. So Paul and Silas have been released from prison. It's only now that Paul reminds everyone he's a Roman citizen and protests against the flogging that they've both received and demands an apology from the magistrates. Now, it would have been quite unusual for a Jew from the eastern end of Turkey 
to have been a Roman citizen. We don't know how Paul came about this privilege. Perhaps his father or his grandfather had been awarded it because of services to Rome. But in any case, how would Paul prove to the magistrates that he was in fact a Roman citizen? We know that citizens were given a certificate inscribed on thin pieces of wood or bronze. But would Paul have carried those around with him on his journeys and through all the dangers? Or would perhaps he have kept them in a safe place somewhere? We don't really know, but one way or another, Paul actually demonstrated that his citizenship was real. The church which Paul established at Philippi, and to which he wrote his letter, perhaps 10 years after his first visit, must have been a fair size, perhaps 50 adults and uh, their families as well with them. But exactly what would this church have looked like? What different kinds of people would have formed part of it? Stephen Travis has been looking in detail at this question. Well, if we think about the population of the city as a whole, that would be about 10,000 and maybe another 5,000 living outside the walls. Uh, only a tiny number of these would be the elite, the ruling class. Um, less than 1%. 20% probably would be farmers, descendants of the veterans uh, who were there when the city was founded 100 years before. And um, the largest group would be service workers, people like bakers, shoemakers, craftspeople of all sorts. They would be about 40% of the population. And then 20% uh, probably would be poor, people living below the subsistence level. And another 20% would be slaves. So that's the kind of general balance of population within the city as a whole. To get to what extent are these uh, proportions represented in the church itself? Uh, we can't be precise about this, but we can get some kind of idea. It's very unlikely at this stage that um, any of the church would belong to the elite class. Although certainly there were elite members later on, after Paul's time. The majority of the church, more than 50%, would be part of that service community because they were the group to whom Paul had natural access through his own work as a craftsman. Um, making tents and doing leather work and so on. Uh, poor people would also be represented in the church because again they are the kinds of people who would meet with Paul. They couldn't avoid it if they were in the marketplace uh, looking for work or begging. And then a substantial number also would be slaves. Now nearly all those people would be Greek we know that there were very few Jews in Philippi at this time because uh, Lydia had to meet by the, uh, by the river. There weren't enough people to form a synagogue. And then 